let us go through and discuss optimization. This is actually using some uh, slide material I've developed for Aerospace Capstone, but it already had a module about optimization, so why make new material if some already exists? The opening function here is just an example of a, an intentionally noisy, it's a kind of cupped shaped sinusoidal trial function that I made for evaluating different optimization routines. Uh, it's important to put them against uh, non-trivial solutions that are not smooth and pro provide plenty of traps and, and uh, restrictions so that the function actually has to work, uh, work quite hard to find an optimal solution amongst a lot of noise. Starting very simply though, if you had to solve just a simple equation, x squared plus 3x plus 3, in, in a number of minutes if you had to optimize that, find the maximum or minimum, you would just take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and you know that at those points you'd be at a, uh, at a max or min of the function. You wouldn't know if it's a global max, global min, but more on those labels later. This would be even possible for you know, two dimensions. You just, you just can take the partial in both directions, find when both dimensions are zero. But then as, as things get a little bit uh, complex, quite literally, the real component of a complex number, I get it, uh, you may not want to employ the, the algebraic form of optimization. You don't want to necessarily take the derivative set equal to zero. You, you might want to seek the optimal solution numerically. So those are the methods we're here to discuss. If it's a simple uh, plotted shape like the simple curvature shown up top right, then the optimizer should vary directly and easily proceed towards the solution. If you have noise in a measurement or noise in a surface or significant error in your model or simulation, then maybe it does not proceed quite as directly to the solution, but one should still be possible to find the optimal. The old school way of doing optimization or at least system improvements was to do carpet plots. This is back from the era where it may take 30 minutes, an hour to run a jet engine simulation with just you know algebraic input and output when computers are still slow. Obviously we're living in a bit different world now, but the investment of time to generate this five by five carpet plot here on the right, you know, that could be measured in hours if not like an overnight type task. And also nice because you can come into these carpet plots, plot many different types of constraints. You're looking at the comparison of two different uh, design variables, both the A and B axes. One could maybe be uh, engine horsepower. The other might be total vehicle weight. Who knows what you're working on? Uh, it, it could easily, easily pay off. And it's easy to cross different lines across these. Like I said, uh, you might have a total constraint on acceleration. You might have a total constraint on you know, drive shaft torque allowance. I could curve through there in interesting ways. It's a good way to put a whole lot of data in a small amount of space, but I have to hate on carpet plots a little bit because you can make the slopes show whatever you want. Uh, the convention is to have the highest point immediately over the lowest point. But when you realize this is really just a three-dimensional surface of, of slight curvature, uh, and, you, and you're spinning it around in space, you could rotate this a different direction and make this left-hand line look almost vertical, implying a different derivative or slope. And the slopes are, in the end, meaningless. I mean, it's hard to assign uh, useful purpose to the slopes here. So uh, I generally just say, don't mess with it. We have better methods now. People got a little bit crazy with carpet plots. Too many lines. If you go multiple dimensions, you can plot a carpet plot of this, and if you only care about the output in one major dimension, perhaps this is score, that's total race time or lap time, whatever you're looking for, uh, perhaps it at least helps you interpolate, but it starts to get very, very messy. Three-dimensional carpet plots exist. You're looking at an example of one right here, but just, just don't. Especially if you start putting constraints or other outputs mapped onto the carpet plot, then it gets really messy really fast. Uh, messier really fast and it's, it's not worth doing so overall I would suggest graphical art artifacts aside I'll suggest proceeding on to contour plots for showing the optimal regions of your engineering problems especially for those problems that are quick to solve generating a contour plot like this with smooth bounds requires the evaluation of hundreds of points throughout this domain I mean, it's very obvious to see that the minimum is probably somewhere up here at x negative 1.5, y of you know, maybe 0.75, somewhere right there in that region. You can grab useful data 
off the chart in, in both dimensions. You see where the minimum is at. You see how the, how fast the slopes are rising. You see individual values of the output function of your interest, the Z function, if you will, uh, labeled on each contour. Uh, this behavior can be done on carpet plots, in fairness. But the relative slopes between sizes sides is uh, much more readily apparent in a contour plot. They're obviously limited to two dimensions, though some uh, um, silly, I'll say, attempts to display a third dimension through color, a third dimension through size of a dot, size of, size of font. You have to think of something else you can scale to represent a third dimension of data. It's you're more or less presenting on a two-dimensional screen, so that's what you get, 2D data. The examples we'll be going through, first of which will be very simple, be gradient search optimization, second of which will be an elegant method that I happen to like a lot, developed by Reinhardt, called LeapFrog. These will be evaluated on MATLAB's peaks, peaks function, which is not the only function they work on, of course, but it is a nice uh, built-in, thankfully, um, function it's, it's actually piecewise and made of many different uh, curves but they all fit together to create a three-dimensional feature that has many peaks and valleys uh, local max local mins global max global min so it's a good test of optimization functions on smooth and continuous surfaces some terminology that's very useful to you when discussing optimization would be like in this case, a slice of a two-dimensional function or a one-dimensional function, whatever whatever the case may be, the blue line would be your objective function. Like if you're trying to optimize uh, score for a design-build fly mission, or if you're trying to optim minimize, aka okay, optimize, the elapsed time in a drag racing run, you might be looking at uh, the amount of horsepower on the vehicle versus elapsed time. With too little horsepower, you obviously accelerate slowly. It takes a long time to get there. With too much horsepower, you just spin the tires the whole way and you get there slowly again. But that evolution of your score, in this case, the y-axis y here would be elapsed time. Uh, this is definitely not a drag racing example. That's not what the curve would look like at all. But any shift in the, in the objective function is, is good to plot. Local maxima are where the objective function hits essentially a, a hill, a hill peak. That might be the largest highest point in the county whereas the global maxima would be the largest and highest point in the continent in the entire region of consideration so if this square indicated the regions from left to right that you cared about in totality one is called a local maxima because it is a peak you have reached the crest of a hill if you're standing there you can look in all directions you look down until you see this taller mountain over here you're like okay now i have to go climb that if you're looking for the best engineering solution, you need to find the global max. You need to reject any sort of local maxima that exists. You need to reject local minima that exists if you're trying to minimize and try to go over here to the very far right hand side of the domain and find the local, or excuse me, the global minimum. So those are just definitions. Global is the maximum anywhere in the, in the domain you're looking at. Locals, whether max or min, are, well, regional. They're just, they are a peak or they are a trough but they are not the best. They're not the, the lowest. Makes sense, right? Essential knowledge for optimization may include derivative knowledge. Whether this is partial derivative, whether this is central or backward, or forward or backward approximation, you may have seen this before in the class. In fact, I hope you have. Uh, this was all of the derivative-based chapter, I believe chapter eight. So we in fact have a multitude of differential forms that include not only just central differencing for two points, three points, you know, up to, out to, I think, five point central differencing methods, so of higher orders as well. An important thing to understand about optimization is that you will more or less be looking to minimize or maximize the objective function. The objective function naming the output that you care about, elapsed time, score, um, profit, whatever it may be. So if you have a function that is made to minimize, say the top graph. You could say, okay, function, here's your initial point of four, and it will march along and find the, the minimum here of zero. So the minimum of the function x squared is valued at zero at a location of zero. But now what if you want to find the maximum value of x squared? Well, its maximums are way out here. It, it branches up infinitely, so it would just have to be couched as, it have to be restricted as, the maximum value within a certain bound, because this is unbounded up, unbounded positively. So 
look at the difference that exists between x squared and negative x squared. If you were given a function that could only maximize, and this x squared plot is what you were going for, all you'd have to do is multiply your objective function by negative 1. It inverts the world down to this second, uh, second plot. And then now your maximizing function is actually truthfully, unbeknownst to it, finding you the minimum value of the true function you care about. So the, the relationship between minimizing and maximizing is just a factor of negative 1. Invert the world, invert the output, uh, and you're done. So this is why optimization functions are generally, as convention, only written to minimize values. They seek the smallest result. Because if you need to find the maximum result, you just take your objective function, the function, the physical function usually that describes, again, profit, lapse time, some engineering parameter of significance. And if you want to find the maximum value, well, you just take that objective function, multiply it by negative one, you've inverted that world, and yeah. So now the you get the maximum output instead of the minimum. But the code thinks it found a very big negative number when in reality you made it find a very big positive number which is great. So only you only need to write the code once. You don't need to go and rewrite all the theory therein to write both a minimizer and a maximizer. Nope, just take the objective function, multiply it by negative one, you're good to go. In terms of design variables, these are the things you would change, and there can be multiple of them. These are the dimensions you will change the design by, or the, I guess it'd be a design, or the engineering project, the simulation, whatever you're doing by to change the objective function. In this case, the example pictured changed the aircraft wingspan and the root cord of the vehicle. And the output here in colored regions is the score that that code predicted. In fact, it's a bounded region, right? So you have this entire region of, of white area here that had no score. And well, guess what? That's the region, that's the line on which the aircraft stalls. So if you chose an aircraft wingspan of two and a half feet, and a root cord of 0.5 feet, this code predicts you don't fly at all. If you chose 3.5 and, and 1.125, you'd be right about here, scoring nearly optimally. The scary part of this is it shows that the score continually increases as you approach failure. So the closer you get to that cliff, the better you do. Don't be over here. That'd be bad. Be on this side. Be on the side that works, the side that functions. Also, it's important to realize that in all of this optimization, you're dependent on engineering models, uh, which will have inherent error. No matter how good your measurements are, no matter how good your predictions are, no matter how good the theory is, uh, this boundary is approximate. So you don't want to go exactly up to the boundary and say, ah, that is perfect. My tires will not explode during a drag race at that speed. And then you run and yeah, they, you're on the wrong side of the models and accuracy. You want to leave yourself some margin, some engineering margin. And that's come, that comes back down, just down to good engineering qualities after you perform the optimization step. But anyway, design variables are the design features. In some circumstances, you may be only doing one variable of optimization. You may only care about how much horsepower do I put in the dragster to go faster, to get the minimum time. Uh, in some cases, like in aircraft design and electronics design and chemical reactions or refinery optimization. In fact, recently I've been doing uh, antenna optimization. You might be doing three, four, five different design variables simultaneously with three or four different weighted uh, values making up your objective function because there's not one single input and one single output that gives you the best of everything. You have this balanced desire among several outputs of merit. Maybe it's just going fast. You also want to be safe. You also want to look good while doing it, I guess. And then the inputs may be horsepower. The inputs may be weight. The inputs may be technology factor and how much or how fast you spin the engine. Who knows? Those design variables will be specific to the problem you're dealing with. As you make this plot, again, this is an example of not a contour plot. It shows how it's hard to grab information off of some sort of obliquely viewed surface plot. I mean, yeah, this has grid and all three elements. Yes, you can kind of approximate uh, what the value is. And it shows, again, another cliff of where the score falls off. This is, again, where the design would be incapable of finishing one of the missions featured, so it, it just discreetly falls, which is uh, not so great. 
But still, use contour plots is not so great uh, way to show it to show data. All of this engineering problem has to be considered in the frame of constraints. The A380 pictured was designed within the constraints of fitting into airports. That's an important feature for commercial airliners is you have to actually be able to go pick up your passengers where they're at. That was actually one of the governing constraints of A380 design and optimization. They maxed out the width of many uh, terminals. So they wanted the, to make the wing larger in span. The optimal solution was to make the wing of the A380 bigger. But they were physically restricted in size by pulling up to the gate. So constraints can come in many forms. I mean, at some point, you can no longer increase the RPM of your engine because it explodes. I mean, 400,000 RPM would give great horsepower for the one microsecond that the engine survives before detonating. Uh, it just, these kind of physical limits have to be put in because optimizers will, if they're good, find every possible opening to exploit a system. The system you've defined. So keep in mind, it's, it's, it's your playground. You're telling the optimizer to go play in it, find the best answer. If, if you leave the door open to get in a part of the domain that doesn't physically exist, then you could be wasting a lot of your computational cycles and time the optimizer is running. So make sure that you've set up proper constraints. Uh, like, for example, if you're optimizing the flight path of an air, airplane, a good constraint to put in is that altitude is greater than zero. Uh, obvious physical, you know, earthen constraints at zero feet above ground level for an aircraft. So things like that, I mean, unless, unless you specifically uh, denote it, it's, it's not going to be followed by the optimizer and you'll be kind of stuck. Something that may be difficult to describe, but if you can pull off, is very, very, very useful, is the idea of Pareto optimality. This is an example, again, from Aerospace Capstone, previous years. It's, it's the data that we've generate it. So I use those examples because that's where, where we've walked in the past. But perhaps an easier example to understand is going back to the simple drag racing examples. Fewer inputs, fewer outputs. Kind of, you know, everybody knows what drag racing is more or less. If something's out of your control, namely, let's say the friction coefficient of the track you arrive at, you as a competitor cannot determine or change what that friction coefficient is. You can get the best tires you can, but you show up, you're going to measure mu on the track. And if it had just rained, it's going to be very low. If it's frozen on ice, it would be extraordinarily low. If it's a asphalt track, if it perhaps it's concrete, or who knows, somebody put sandpaper down everywhere, the friction coefficient can vary. But along with that, so does the optimal amount of horsepower you should try to put down. If you're drag racing on ice your optimal horsepower for the system would be very different than if you are drag racing on sandpaper. Uh, and that's really what this example looks like in a little bit more complex form. In this case, the variable that was out of our control for computation was wind speed, headwind velocity for the aircraft. Uh, every pink dot on this chart is a solution that the optimizer presented. So every pink dot contains perhaps within it 20 to 100 more runs of the simulation code so you're, you're literally looking at about, I think it was in the end, four to six hours of computation and data output uh, across several different days till the students got this part right. And you might be saying, okay, why do all these pink points lie away from the boundary? Well, this was performed on about nine to 13 dimensions, nine to 13 design variables of, of optimization. So quite a few different things can change at once and sometimes the optimizer thinks it's found the best solution for a particular wind speed and well if you run it again at that exact same input with a different random seating it can eventually find a better answer so for example right at about 15 feet per second of wind it found answers in score ranging from about 3200 to f over 5000 the best answers as long as your models are trustworthy and accurate lie at the maximum of this cloud of points. If every point, if you trust that every point is achievable and will work, then the Pareto optimality frontier is the pinnacle of each uh, independent headwind velocity. So this is the variable we cannot control. We cannot control wind speed when we show up to competition. However, we know that if the wind happened to be zero miles an hour, 
We'd go up here to this little pink dot, figure out what design variables that contained, what the, what the wingspan was, what the cord was, what the fuselage length was at that point, and build the plane to get the maximum score at zero headwind velocity. If we happen to show up to competition and the headwind velocity was 15 feet per second, we'd go up here and measure this point. And even though the score is similar, the actual design variable inputs to achieve a similar score could be different. Each one of those pink points is a different set of, of variables. How different they are, you'd have to have some other charts and plots to determine. Could be possible. But we went through the headache of plotting our design, our specific fixed geometry design, its performance across the entire range of wind speeds. So we had actually picked the average wind speed of Wichita, Kansas at 22.5 feet per second as our design speed. Makes sense. You know, it's average wind speed. We maybe a little bit higher, a little bit lower. But this selected design, without changing geometry, at higher wind speeds, stayed very, 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 very near the Pareto Optimality Frontier. So it was able, at higher wind speeds, to still achieve similar performance to all other aircraft possibilities. At lower wind speeds, you see that our selection actually costs the team uh, a few hundred points. So... In truth, this shows that we are susceptible to being beat if the wind happened to be slower. We were not likely to be defeated or to be bested if the wind was blowing faster because our aircraft would still perform very near, if not at, the Pareto Optimality Frontier. So this type of understanding demonstrates a, a very deep knowledge of the system and very deep knowledge of the overall performance and the trade-offs associated with variables that are out of your control. It's one thing to find a system that works. It is a better thing to find the best possible system that can work. And then what you've done here is do that task of finding the best possible system that can work at multiple, at, uh, at multiple points in a variable that's out of your control. So it's the best possible system that can work in multiple circumstances, which is, is really high-level engineering, and I hope that you have the privilege of doing that with a, with a discipline you enjoy as much as I enjoy aerospace. It's, it's rewarding when it all finally works and comes together. In truth, the output of this competition is that our score, I believe, was down here in the 1,000 region. The, <laughs> the models were more or less right, but it was... It was a design mistake outside of the optimization that led to us having to massively increase battery weight, massively abandon some of the strategy that would have taken us to such a high scoring potential and, and settle for something that was, that was not quite as competitive. So again, when you seek optimality, be sure that you can achieve those, those marks. Uh, be sure that you're not right on the ragged edge of performance and know that if your engineering models don't, check for some sort of mistake or problem that could occur, then you might be susceptible to it. So you can only optimize what you've successfully put into your code. But it's time to look at some examples of actual optimization methods. The topics of conversion, convergence, exactly the same in other areas. We've talked about convergence for nonlinear equations. We've talked about convergence for iterative matrix solutions. We've talked about convergence for differential equations. So it's whenever the updated, the sequential iteration updates of the best point versus the previous best point have reached a tolerance. So whenever you are throwing more and more iterations at an optimization and you're not getting any better answer, then at some point you just have to say, okay, I'm finished. Or if all the different guesses or seed values for, a, for an optimization routine are not improving with sequential uh, iteration, then you're done. Call it finished. You can use optimization to, I should say numeric optimization, to find the root in a, in a Newton secant method. You can have an initial function you wish to optimize, take the derivative of that function, and then if you use the Newton secant method you learned about chapter 3, I believe, you can find the zero of the derivative, and that's it. That's the optimal. If you can find the derivative by hand, though, you'll probably just solve for zero using some other method, and that won't really be used that often which it's not used that often. The most common and most simplistic way to teach optimization is gradient search. That's a circumstance in which you initially just guess where to start 
And this piecewise, I guess it is a function because it's only single value at the, at the disconnect. The global minimum would be all the way over here on the right-hand side. If you started at P1, the gradient search optimization would take a step to the right and say, okay, good, it's going down, let's continue. It would take a step to the right and say, okay, good, it's going down, let's continue. And it just repeats that process until it finds this point at which it says, oh, no, that step went up. Let's go back. And it would sequentially decrease the step size and start bouncing back and forth in this, in this trough. And it says, okay, I finally found the bottom. The derivative here is approximately zero. I'm done. Here's the optimal solution. So in this case, if you started at P1, randomly or, or by direction to the algorithm, it would find the local minimum roughly at P6. So it stops in that trough. If you started, however, over here on the right-hand side of the equation, and uh, let's say right on this left-hand side of the slope, it, the gradient search would seek the reduction. It would go all the way down here until it sees an increase, and it would turn back around, and the points would successfully settle in this local, in this local minimum, which also happens to be the global minimum. The gradient optimizer has no clue about any of that. It has one piece of information, where it's at, and what the slope is. It determines its life course by what is the slope, where is the wind blowing me. We have a, we, I, whatever you want to call it, have a demonstration of this in the peaks function. So this is the viewpoint you will have of peaks here forward in contour form. But just to show it to you in three dimensions, the global max is the peak yellow, the maximum yellow region. The global min is the min, yellow, min blue region. And there are a few locals available to trap the functions. This all happens within a functional region of positive three to negative three in both dimensions. And then away from these plots, it really more or less gets flat, and there are, there are some slope derivatives, but they're very, very benign. So overall, if we are maximizing, we'd like to see it finish at a point here of approximately x0, y of 1.8-ish. And then if we're minimizing, we'd like to see it at x of, I don't know, what is that, 0.2, y of negative 1.7. So we'll see what happens. Let's close up the plot. The gradient demo, let's run the... Gradient demo. So what this is feeding is that I'm letting it. Oops. All right, let it iterate. What is feeding is that I've told it to search between negative three and three and negative three and three. So it's a two-dimensional optimization, right? With maximum uh, h value, so maximum step multiplication of 0 0.01. So if we run it and we take a look at the plot, you can see that this one got massively lucky and guessed a point right near the local minimum. So as we press spacebar, it is just settling into its home. It was basically born into luxury. It's, it has very little work to do to arrive at a decent spot. But notice it settled right into the local minima, not the global, which exists down here, uh, the better option for the minimization. So it's just started off in the wrong spot. Let's run this again. Gradient demo, pop open the graph. Okay, so we've initialized up here in the top right-hand corner. By the way, the random seed, it is entirely random. Um, it'll go from negative 3 to positive 3 in both dimensions. So we start top right, and this gets really boring really fast because even though I am iterating, even though I'm pressing spacebar and updating the iteration steps, because the derivative is so slow and this stepping methodology I use in this particular gradient search implementation takes a step size proportion to proportionate to the gradient, uh, yeah, it's, it's not doing much. I can even sit there and hold it down, and it just takes forever to move an inch. So let's abort that execution, try for a different initial seed. That's going to be boring again because it's out in white space. Uh, it's not going to do much. I'm trying to find a seed that will generate something interesting. Nope. Do you see the problem now with gradient search optimization? It is immensely susceptible to the initial seed which finally I think we found something that's gonna do the right job. So you can see the point here down about uh, x equals one point something, y equals negative 2.1, we'll say. As I press spacebar sequentially, it is riding the steepest descent gradient. Taking steps, moving in that direction. So now as it is an increasingly negative location, it moves, starts to move a bit faster towards, you can just envision this as rolling downhill. It rolls down towards that global minima, at which point it now starts slowing down, and it has found it. So good, it only took us like six or ten or however many initializations of the function it was for it to be right the first time. So it's a success, a success rate of 
what, like less than 10%, maybe, who knows. To get a real number for that, you'd have to, you know, run the simulation thousands of times on many different types of functions, and it all depends on the seed location. The nice thing is it's easy to filter through a whole lot of optimization runs and find the best answer because, well, if you have 100 numbers, you look for the smallest one, and that's the minimum. So gradient search is simple to implement. It's simple to understand. You quite literally just numerically evaluate the derivative at the point you're located at, take a step exactly in that x direction, take a step in that y direction, and you're done. For two dimensions, it's two derivatives, two partials, I should say. For three dimensions, it's three partials. You can't really visualize that as well, of course. For nine dimension, it would be nine partial derivatives. You take a step in all nine dimensions, and you just hope you eventually move to the global min. There's no guarantee you will. And that all depends on the shape of the design space you're working within. So let's pop back open the PDF and go through an improvement. The sophisticated method I want to discuss because I find it both efficient, concise in code, and, and, and algorithm as well. The idea behind it is very simple. And it just works. It's highly performing, even when compared against uh, algorithms that require many, many, many more lines of code than that which is implemented here. Leapfrog optimization is a method of swarm optimization. Instead of just using one single point, one single guess, to figure out where the optimal in an entire domain lies, this starts with multiple seeds. You can choose the number, but uh, I think by default for Leapfrog, it's programmed at 10 seeds per dimension. So since this is a two-dimensional problem, x and y, it'll have 20 initialization points. So that creates a seed cloud. Each one of those points more or less shares information with one another. Like, oh, hey, I'm at 5. Oh, you're at negative 3. That's better. I should go over there. Like, oh, hey, come over here. I'm at negative 6. You know, it's, gosh, that sounds really cheesy, but that's kind of what it's doing. They're able to share information. You get the scattering because you will not have this nice gradient overlay, this nice contour plot overlay on a problem you're trying to optimize. Uh, that, that knowledge is unknown to you. You know six points when you're numerically optimizing problems in engineering or science or whatever. Uh, you only have information for the points you've calculated. So moving forward, the leapfrog optimization begins by seeding, and then it moves to identifying the worst point and the best point, quite literally just ranking all the points from the, the high, in this case, since it's a minimizer, the worst point would be the highest valued and the best point would be the lowest valued out of all the random seeds. Third step, it, it defines a quadrant between the worst and the best, so this regional square. It flips that quadrant of possibility and then defines a random seed within that new quadrant, thus the leapfrogging name, to uh, place the point at. Now, a couple of things happen here. If you randomly seed inside of a, the opposite quadrant, the average of millions and millions of random seedings would be right in the middle. It's not because there's a bell curve, it's because it's entirely uniform if it's truly random. So the average of a square of randomness would be the centroid of the square. That results in a contraction of the average distance away from that point it's jumping over, while introducing some chaos to allow for perhaps an advantageous placement of that point. In this case, it happened to land outside of the bounds. Like, we've limited this whole search between negative 3 and 3 in all dimensions, so since it landed just outside of 3, you could either logically have it perform another skip till it lands inside the bounds, or you could just scooch that point right back inside the domain, which, which is what we've done here in this depiction. It's a little bit algorithmically clean, because if you had a small region amongst a big flip to turn over, you might be doing 400 random seeds before you finally go in the lands inside the domain. Anyway, moving on towards convergence ideas, there are multiple ways you can do it. One of the most uh, strict is to define the radius that all of the points exist between. Look at the difference in x. Uh, if you're going to do true radius, you'd have to find the centroid of all the points and finally calculate the actual radius, etc. But you could just look at the x variance and the y variance, the dimensional variance essentially boxing in all the points. And then once the largest dimension of that box descends beneath your convergence criterion, you're done. Do all the points need to be in, inside of that? Do you only do it for the top 50% of points? It depends on how accurate you want your solution, how confident you want to be. Uh, there are circumstances where half the points could have found this lovely local minima, but one guy over there has, has suddenly or is getting close to finding a global min. Uh, so much of this method is based a little bit on randomness that 
you can never be quite certain exactly how it performs, but it is, it is among all methods available. The fact that you're sh taking the shotgun approach, multiple seeds, you're leaping over and not pure gradient based, it, it has a lot of merit, and you'll see that demonstrated shortly. So once you've evaluated the convergence criteria and found out that, yeah, okay, it's actually not converged yet. These points are scattered all over the place. You continue that procedure. You rename the worst point. You find, rename the best point. In this case, that stayed the same. You would continue on forward, leaping the worst over the best until you finally get all the points within some small size, which you say is good enough. That size is probably much smaller than that depicted here, uh, but it, you know, the convergence criteria is entirely up to the user. So let's look at a code implementation of LeapFrog. Uh, taking the LeapFrog demo code, we have to first define the... Oops, that's still doing gradient. Cancel. Danger. Uh, LeapFrog demo. We are operating within bounds of negative 3 to 3 in X, negative 3 to 3 in Y. We have a convergence criterion of 0 0.0001. Now what's interesting is I don't have to provide this a, a specific number of dimensions. It, it infers the number of dimensions I'm scanning by the number of boundaries I give it. So I've given it two dimensions of boundary conditions. So it means I'm going to be optimizing in two dimensions. I don't have to provide it initial seeds, though you could rewrite the code to do that if you wanted to. Uh, it's going to randomly seed in both dimensions. You could also reprogram it to geometrically seed and do like a grid pattern seeding. So that way you make sure that you start the search with a specified grid density. A random seed could potentially leave a gap in a region of importance that you wouldn't even know exists because you never evaluated the point. All right, let's run it. So this is the initial seeding of the leapfrog domain. You see peaks function, okay, so it's, let's look here, I think initially it's seeking the minimum. So it says the worst point is the one here by this massive peak. Okay, that's a very high point. This is a very low point. It got lucky. Look, that basically guessed through complete chance the very minimum value. If I press spacebar once, it takes that worst point and it jumped it over somewhere over here. Probably something new appeared in this region. So it sorted everything again. It found like, okay, this is still the best point. This is one is now the worst point. So watch, this one's going to disappear. And by our logic, the square that bounds these two points together should be inverted and you should see a new point appears somewhere over here in this region. There it is. It randomly got seeded right down there. So now this is the worst. That'd be a very narrow path. So we should see this one leapfrog over and appear somewhere over there. It decided to jump over that location and this continues. Worst point, best point, jumps over. See it appear over here somewhere. There it was. And it just keeps going and going and going and all these points. No, come back. Hit the plot. All these points eventually just collapse down into a region in this case, the global minima. In most cases I run, it converges very quickly to the global min. Uh, it occasionally will, for this peaks function, get trapped in the local, but overall it works very, very, very well. So let's watch it again just because it's very satisfying. What? Enter. Oh, hit the wrong enter. So in this case, ooh, this, will, this will be more interesting because look, nothing. We did not get as lucky this time that one of them happened to hit this global min. So will it discover it? It thinks right now the best point is at this local min. So it's going to start flipping all of these other locations around this local minima. And it may not work out. So again, this one draws the square box between itself and the, and the minimum. And it'll invert, invert that quadrant over on the right-hand side. So it'll appear over here somewhere. Yep. So let's see if it ever breaks out of this local or if it sucks all of the points in and loses hope. No! Oh, oh! No, that's the worst point. Oh, man. Oh, oh, that was close. That was actually really close. Shucks. I think it's, I think this one loses. So we're 50-50 right now. One success, one failure. It sucked all the points into the minima. All right. Done with you. Cancel that. Let's run it again. It's kind of interesting. So, of course, this one's going to work. Look, the, the minimum's close enough that it's going to grab all those points, pull everything in. There's no way for it skipping out. Okay, that result is, is apparent. Let's run it again. 
uh, is this a boring circumstance? Maybe it's, it's already got, you can see the initialization. As long as there is a seed in the optimal location, it will probably figure the rest out. Uh, to my knowledge, there is not an optimization method that will reject 100% of the local minima, except for just absolute massive brute force, uh, overly gridded searching functions. So, and again, you just continue running this so the convergence tolerance is satisfied, but anytime I hold down spacebar, just let it run a bunch of points, it, it closes out the, uh, the plot. In fact, let's do that and I'll just show you that once it hits its convergence tolerance, it spits out the answer. So there is the X and Y coordinate. Uh, no, excuse me. Top two X and Y coordinate. Bottom is the value. So it actually gives you the functional evaluation as an output. So leapfrog is, is a very powerful routine. In fact, the code as written can be implemented on any number of dimensions. One dimension, five dimensions, 50 dimensions, whatever you want. Uh, if you wanted to go in and make sure that you are more likely to get a seed value in a location you can up the number of seeds per dimension to 20. since we have two dimensions we have 20 seeds per each let's just do 50 seeds per dimension to demonstrate the point run the code again look at the difference in the plot and as you would expect way more little ants crawling around in the swarm uh, 100 different points now we have two dimensions 50 seeds per dimension that's 100 total bits this seems like a good thing and it is you are much more likely to uh, find the the global minima this way. The downside is that it's going to take a lot longer to solve. You're moving more points around. There's more functional evaluations. In fact, one other detriment that maybe could be improved in this algorithm just became apparent uh, or just isn't a place to be called out. Look at the massive grouping of points here on the very bottom axis. That's not because that's a great location. It's because so many points leapfrogged away from this high bound all the way across the minimum point to some domain out here and we're otherwise just pushed back to the edge. Maybe it would be great to push them back a random distance from the edge. Uh, who knows? Apply some randomness to that because it doesn't really do us a great bit of service to put massive amounts of grid resolution down here on, along that edge. So, I don't know. I mean, so obviously in this case it's going to converge down here to that uh, global min. As we would expect, putting 100 points into such a small area, it's a very dense seating. So there we go. It's all approaching in. Notice also that it really got close to this local minima. It, that, that shot a potential point very near that local min trough. But it's already been outshown. The best point here is, is very close to the minima. But it's going to take many, 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 many more iterations to converge 100 total seed points to the, to the, mac, or to the minimum value than it is to converge 20 total. So let's just X out of that, cancel the code. I'll show you one last thing though. If we want to turn this into, rewrite the whole code to turn to a maximizer, all you have to do is go down to where it calls the objective function, multiply the objective function by negative one, save, run, and then now it's a maximizer. That's what we were talking about in the slide set about how if you want to uh, switch the flip the world upside down just multiply by negative one and now instead of seeking a minimum you're seeking a maximum you can see it's clustering all the points up near this max and even though I still have the point count turned way up too high uh, you see it is functioning and drawing the point cloud in closer so it again had some locals that were in these other modest peaks but definitely is drawing everything in towards this uh, this global max so it's gonna work out Optimization is massively, massively useful. It definitely falls in that category of uh, top-level tools. You might make up an algorithm out of some sort of matrix routine or a derivative estimate, some of these other numeric uh, things we've studied in the different chapters, but optimization is something that controls... It's pulling the strings behind the scene. It is the, it is the controlling algorithm, oftentimes, for searching for the best engineering solution. If you are going to go through the level of, opt of optimizing a solution, make sure that the models you're using underneath it are correct and accurate. Um, there is kind of an optimal level of sophistication as well. If you throw an optimizer on top of a massive CFD code that takes two days to run, and you expect to run 40,000 points to find the best possible configuration of a, of a winglet, we'll see you in like three years when your computation finishes. Uh, so there's a time involvement too. You have to consider it's nice to make a lightweight fast running code underneath an optimizer so that it provides useful information in a short period of time 
It's a massively useful engineering result. Chase Pareto Frontiers. It's a very rewarding experience when you can do that in a discipline you care about.